Welcome back along Crime Network. For those of you who may be joining us, this is Texas versus Roy Oliver. He's a 37-year-old police officer who is now being called a defendant on trial for his life for having shot an unarmed 15-year-old boy who was a passenger in a vehicle. It's a, a very frenetic scene. If you've been watching at least the commentary since I've been on, I'm sure others have uh, done this as well or stated this. These cases are very complex for prosecutors given the wide discretion and the human factors analysis that needs to go in and the law that allows the officers to use you use of force, even if it turns out afterwards not to have been uh, the right person, a suspect or a person who is armed and dangerous. And we could have no better guest than Charles Middlestad, who is a criminal defense investigator out of Atlanta, to join us because we are in critical testimony right now, cross-examination of a crime scene investigator. Charles, how are you? I'm fantastic, Bob. How are you? Pleasure okay. to be back on with you, by the way. Yeah, good to be back on with you, buddy. Uh, I love the backdrop there. Hey, Charles, listen, we were talking offline a little bit about human factors analysis here. Uh, so give me your, your point of view about this case and how human factors analysis will come into play, you being a criminal defense investigator. Yes. In fact, you know, that, that really tends to be the issue, unless there's something overtly egregious um, you know, juries are very reluctant to second guess an officer's split second decision um, because it is, it is a really uh, difficult job, right? We, it's very difficult to put yourself back in that um, exact scenario and that uh, exact um, frame of mind where you're second guessing um, uh, the, whether an officer was in fear for his or her safety. And so uh, there is a great reliance, as I suspect is going to be in this case, on um, the physical evidence and uh, the, the positional aspects of um, shell casings, of shot locations on the vehicle. It sounds like there are potentially um, a large number of witnesses, so there's going to be testimonial evidence. There's body camera footage, and, uh, and also, uh, as I understand it, this officer's partner, who um, has his own perspective and has already testified about whether he was in fear for his safety. Um, but again, that doesn't necessarily change uh, this officer's, Officer Oliver's perspective or, or, uh, as to whether he was in fear of his safety. Yeah, you're, the positional issues that you bring out are important because people can view things differently. And with the use of force law and to convict beyond a reasonable doubt for violating it, having gone through the firearms training myself, you can be in a scenario where five police officers don't think that there's a need to shoot and one does. And it doesn't necessarily right. mean the one that does is wrong under the law. So that's why it makes it very difficult. It's about what a reasonable officer perceiving at that time, whether or not there was a threat of serious bodily injury or death to individuals and that it was reasonable. And gosh, Charles, you should know because you've represented some pretty high level uh, clients. Give us a little bit of, of your background there. Well, you know, Bob, I've had the good fortune for the last 20, almost 28 years of uh, being a member of uh, some very uh, prominent and uh, impressive defense teams coast to coast. Uh, including athletes, politicians, recording artists. Uh, I've done terrorism cases like the Olympic Park bomber, um, Eric Rudolph, in 1996. Uh, I've had um, NFL clients from uh, Ben Roethlisberger to Jamal Lewis. I was involved in the, in the Ray Lewis case. Uh, a, a ton of different uh, rap artists from Rick Ross to T.I. to Waka Flocka to Migos. Um, so the, 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 I've been very, very fortunate, Bob, to work with some uh, really excellent attorneys. And, of course, in these well-funded cases, as you know, uh, you have the opportunity to, to uh, bring in experts, um, jury consultants, do mock trials, um, things that ordinary folks, unfortunately, don't generally get the benefit of. And that's why we, unfortunately, have two systems of justice in this country for the haves and the have-nots. But uh, uh, I've been mostly um, fortunate to be a part of uh, some really well-funded cases where you get to do all the things that you really would want to do in the defense of a case. Yeah, well stated. Hey, listen, we're on there with the crime scene detective. He's on cross-examination, Charles, and he's getting hit. As a prosecutor, I want to cringe. I may not show that table. I'm sure I'll be making it look like uh, it's it's nothing. But with the right. stupid little petty things that can make a big difference, like did you bring your cones and did you do, it makes right. it look sloppy. So let's go into court and listen to more cross-examination. We'll catch you on the other end, Charles. 
Okay, welcome back. I'm with Charles Middlestat. Uh, before we go to court, I got to get to you, Charles, real quick. I kind of see this defense lawyer is setting it all up, uh, basically going after his credentials, not a member of any professional associations. He's just mentioned one, so you can be sure he's going to come out with stuff that's from literature, from those organizations that he's going to cross-examine, in my opinion, as to what he did or didn't do correctly. Um, and I, it sounds to me like they've got somebody like you on their team because lawyers just, you know, they have to consult experts to know how to ask the questions. My last point here before we get to you, Charles, is you got to be careful as a lawyer when you're doing this. You're playing a little cat and mouse game with that witness because you don't want to turn him into an uber qualified expert. Um, but I think this guy's taking some nicks. What are your thoughts? Absolutely. And, and, and as is the job, the uh, defense attorney's job is to point out the deficiencies of their investigation uh, by pointing out the fact that there are all these other resources available to assist. Bob, I'm a little shocked. And again, I don't know procedurally in, in Texas how it works, but Generally speaking, when there's a, um, a police and a police officer involved shooting, that automatically is that investigation is handed off to the statewide agency. In this case, that would be the department, uh, the Texas Department of Public Safety, which is really the statewide investigative bureau. Um, so the fact that you have somebody from the Dallas County Sheriff's Office who's involved in the crime scene investigation um, is a little perplexing to me. And and as is being pointed out here in cross examination. He um, he has less than stellar credentials necessarily, and I don't know the full breadth of his experience, but um, uh, I think at, at least from the, the little snippet that we've heard so far, it sounds like the defense is, is definitely scoring some points on this particular state's witness. Yeah, you know, it's never ceased to amaze me. I was very careful as a prosecutor never to fall into this space at trial where they they put witnesses on and call them expert witnesses because they went to a class or they had training and they got a certificate and then they literally explode on the witness stand. As a defense attorney, I've cross-examined one witness so bad once that he came chasing after me in a parking lot. I thought we were going to get into yeah. a fight. And I'm yeah. like, hey, you're the guy that, that called yourself a ballistics expert, you know, because it's just r ridiculous. You want right. to get your very best out there and if your crime scene guy wasn't the best Charles one thing you can do is go get another one that's a top-notch person to kind of bootstrap what wasn't sure. done at the crime scene right no no question and uh, who knows maybe they'll be maybe they'll be doing that and they may find it necessary if they if they originally hadn't planned to do so to bolster this particular witness's testimony and and kind of shore up the the lack of experience and credentials that he may have have someone look over his shoulder essentially and endorse the effort but uh uh it, it sounds like they're being effective and it is very significant again the, the jury is very interested particularly in the csi age that we live in um in learning as much as they possibly can and trying to get as close as they possibly can to putting themselves in the mind of that officer when he pulled the trigger. So uh, the, the trajectory rods that he was referring to, he called them angle rods or something, but they're trajectory rods, which are actually really insightful in, t in terms of understanding, especially positionally, where the officer began firing, the sequence of the fire, the movement of that officer as he fired, because that movement can be very, very significant. Is he moving out of the way of a vehicle? Uh, we, we know already that uh, while the initial report was that the vehicle was coming at him, as it turns out, his, his body camera and his, and his partner have um, betrayed him uh, with regard to that, that um, recollection. So all of this uh, evidence, I think, is really important for the jury to hear. And um, I think this is where the prosecution can really score some points. Well, let's see, because I'd love to see if it's done right. He's asking about literature and professional organizations, and it would be really nice because there's nothing better as a trial lawyer to sit there and point to a book or to point to an article that somebody's authenticated as being the Bible, if you will, and say, you didn't do that, you didn't do this, and you didn't do that. Hence, your conclusions are wrong. Let's get back to court. Okay, we are Texas versus Roy Oliver, 37-year-old police officer on trial for having shot and killed a 15-year-old passenger. He is charged with murder. You're listening to the cross-examination of the defense attorney representing the police officer, Detective Garrick Whaley, and I have with me Charles Middlestat, who is a criminal defense investigator with a tremendous amount of experience. And Charles, just before um, you know we were talking, you see again the defense attorney bringing out a lot of issues here with respect to things that were not done. 
done. Um, so I think he's I think he's still scoring points, but I'm wondering if he's going to go for the grand slam and hit one out of the park. Is he setting it up, or is this all the defense lawyers got? You know, I think he's chipping away at this witness, and he's chipping away at the integrity of the crime scene investigation. I, in this uh, last bit of testimony, what I heard were three things that I found significant. One is he's he's trying to define the extent of the search for any projectiles or any casings. If you recall, Officer Oliver claims that it was based upon some um, gunfire that he heard that he uh, was returning fire in his in his mind. So, and give us two the, and two and three in thirty seconds. Okay, two is the uh, is surveillance footage, trying to find out if they if they did any casing for that. Be very interesting if the defense actually was able to identify some video surveillance, a ring doorbell or something in the area, um, to show again the the uh, uh, the deficiency in the investigation. And then he points out on the on the crime scene diagram that it doesn't necessarily reflect the, the full scope of his testimony, and he's questioning why. Why is it not memorial? What you're testifying to now is not reflected in your crime scene diagram, and why is that the case? Well, now you know why Charles Middlestat is the sought-after expert in this area. He just broke it down too in kind, three areas. I agree with completely. Now, excellent job, Charles, because this is the kind of stuff that creates reasonable doubt in a case of this nature. We'll be back on the other end of the break at Law & Crime Network. Welcome back. Well, they're taking a break in the Roy Oliver case, and you're listening to the testimony of Detective Garrick Whaley uh, from the Sheriff's Department, who's under cross-examination by the defense attorneys um, in the case for a number of things that were, uh, as you can tell from the question, not done, in their opinion, correctly. I've got Charles Middlestat with me. He's a criminal defense investigator of extraordinary talent. Um, Charles, you were you really broke it down uh, in that last one about the three areas of, of attack here and where they're going. What did you think about this testimony is it getting any better for the guy or is it just a kid no. this lawyer just keeps bop, bop, he's bop, good bop, bop, he's bop. very good he's very meticulous he's very methodical um, he either understands both crime scene investigation and uh, forensic science uh, or he's had uh, excellent experts assisting him in preparation for this cross-examination but I'm extremely impressed with his cross-examination skills and um, his ability to break this down he's in this last He's really pointed out, uh, the, the, again, the deficiency, but also a really an egregious contamination of evidence. I mean, it's almost like, um, you know, it's, it's, it's like, uh, you know, some sort of Barney Fife scene here where uh, you have a crime scene tech or some other officer who's actually like in the, in the course of marking evidence, actually spray paints over shell casings and, and absolutely ruins any sort of um, evidentiary value that they may have. Uh, for purposes of lifting prints or, or obtaining DNA evidence. So they will never be able to link those casings to anything. Um, they can't determine whether those casings were fired that night or on some other occasion. I mean, the, it, that's a pretty substantial thing. And, and worse than that for, uh, for the prosecution is, you know, this, this particular witness, uh, D Detective Whaley, in, in, instead of just acknowledging um, th that error, uh, and he's... It's almost like pulling teeth to get him to acknowledge that there, there is no further evidentiary value. Uh, that would be the, the, the smart thing to do in order to maintain his integrity on the stand with regard to the rest of his testimony. But in this case, he's so reluctant to admit the obvious that uh, I think it reflects very poorly on his overall testimony. Yeah, I mean, it's... Um Short of being arrogant and uh, disrespectful in the courtroom, nothing could be worse to a prosecution witness than being incompetent and then unwilling to just give it up. Um, it, either the prosecutor didn't prep the witness correctly or the witness is just one of those witnesses that just won't listen. We've got 30 seconds. What are your thoughts? I, I agree uh, wholeheartedly, Bob. Uh, sometimes you have just, uh, you know, this is actually, and I'm not suggesting he's perjuring himself at all, but whenever I have seen occasions where uh, witnesses or officers perjure themselves, it's not uh, generally done out of malice. It's done out of the fear of uh, embarrassment, embarrassment the fear Charles. of shame. Uh, I, that's I, usually how it happens. I get it. They just don't want to give it up. I'm sorry to cut you off. Right. we got to go to a break. And on the other end, we'll come back with more analysis from Charles.